So, Danny, let's get into it, man. I uh, question and answer, and let's see what we got. So, uh, this is a two-parter question. All right. Two different people, but they kind of go hand in hand. So, the first one is, are you keen on trying MMA? So, I guess a follow-up question would be, do you think you're going to fight again, or will you stick with coaching? Welcome back to Building Hurting Bombs here at Bazooka Kickboxing and MMA. Uh, just as last week we announced, the podcast sponsor is Perfect Sports Nutrition. So make sure you check the link below and you know, support the channel and support Perfect Sports. Use the code Bazooka20 to get 20% off. I've been using their products now for some time. Um, Matt and I, my team nutritionist, did a little talk on how I use supplements. And I just finished my workout, so I have my branch chains in here with my glutamine to get me through this podcast. Uh, so, protein, Costa, it, it, what's up? It doesn't give bad gas, their protein. It's really good. What's so. that, sorry? I thought I'd throw in that it doesn't give me bad gas, their protein. So. Oh, okay, there you go. That's a good start. <laughs> so, Bazooka 20, and you can get gasless protein. So, your stomach feels good. But uh, today, Costa, I'm going to call this podcast Don't Cry Over Spilt Milk because Danny's freaking out here. We had technical issues. He uh -huh. spilt coffee. Your sound wasn't working. We had a power outage. I put a ladder in my car and I cracked my windshield. The heat at the gym's not working. So I told Danny today when he spilt his coffee, don't cry over spilt milk, man. So I'm trying to do like this woo-saw kind of day. Still calming down, man. I'm still calming down. Stressed. <laughs> I don't think Costa's there. Nice. No, here. 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 Well, there. you usually have something to say. <laughs> I'm waiting. I thought you were going to introduce me nice, show that you couldn't find another guest, so I have to come back on again. You know, no, that was. I thought today, because of the storyline at the end, um, I want to talk about Israel Adesanya um, actually going up in weight to 205 because we kind of had a similar situation um, in my career where when I got first signed with Glory, I got signed at 165 pounds to fight Murat Derechi. And that's kind of where I was fighting. The fight before Derechi, I fought at 160, which is the lowest I ever fought. And then we had a little time to put on muscle. So I wanted to um, let everyone know and pick your brain on what's the best approach to kind of go um, to put on weight when you only have a couple minutes, right? Because there's that risk versus reward. Sounds like a plan. And steroids are illegal. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. So to get that much muscle. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just nice uh, uh, to get back here and talk. I mean, um, there's a f funny thing that uh, I was laughing about the other day. I was telling Danny. We uh, had a conversation about using Fiverr. Fiverr. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it would be the worst idea for me in the world. And I think you're right. I get yeah. way too stressed out. I, I'm too much of a perfectionist. Uh, those who uh, don't know what Fiverr is, you can kind of put uh, – you can kind of hire someone to make a logo or a design, and me being a perfectionist, uh, yeah, it didn't go. My experience wasn't that great with it. I thought I thought you only had one revision. I swear you had like ten. Oh, but more than way more than ten. <laughs> You're way hard more. with that. I'm guy. like, buddy, come on, man. Like I, I I simply wrote this is what I want, and you totally gave me something different. Like so, I don't think I'm gonna go back to it. But uh, I thought it'd be cool. You up by not liking uh, the uh, thing? I was the only one who didn't like the uh, design. Yeah, that was for the building herd and bomb. So we, I made. Uh, just to try Fiverr out, I kind of made a logo to the podcast. They didn't come out the greatest. It was all right. I just picked someone cheap to kind of do it. So I don't know. Danny, do you want to put it up to see if people like sure. it or not? Yeah, I'll show it. All right. At least the backstory is no one, everyone refuses to tell Joe when something's not good. I'm the only guy who will tell Joe straight. He's like, well, everyone else says it's good. I go, Joe, everybody's lying to you, man. They're not going to tell you when it's not good. Like, they're, they're, they're scared shitless, even though you're not going to, you know, you're, you're a good guy, but people are still scared shitless. I'm going to tell you because, yeah, you know, you we called have it out. Yeah, but it ended up being better, but I don't know if I love it anyways. But the cool one that I did, I want to see if you guys like this one. So if you guys really enjoy this one, put it into the uh, the comments if you like it. But I put a, a Japanese influence to the Bazooka logo. I'm obsessed with the Japanese culture, the look, my fights in Tokyo. Um, it was a dream to fight in Japan. So I just wanted a little Japanese well, touch I, to it. I have an idea. I have an idea. All right. Everyone can leave their comments below whether or not they like it. But if there's anybody who's a designer who wants to... Give them an idea. Fix it up. Clean fix it up. An yeah, idea, I send like an that. idea. 
If we a like contest? it, we'll use it. Yeah, a contest. Yeah. If we like it, we'll use it, and it'll be our new Look, logo. Can we give yeah. away some uh, perfect sports product for the uh, for the best uh, logo? Yeah, we yeah. can do that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Perfect. Why don't we so, do something like that? So you're saying a logo for the actual podcast? For the podcast. All right, I'm down podcast. for that. All right. So we'll post the original one, kind of what I yeah. kind of made from this mess of Fiverr that yeah. stressed me out. But I also want your opinion on the Japanese design. Yes. I also want everyone's yeah, we'll opinion to too. see if you like it because I might personally just do one uh, for myself to have on a shirt. But if people like it, maybe I'll run a limited uh, design for those. So that's kind of uh, something I am looking at. So, um, yeah, Koss, let's get into uh, – I want to get into this question um, about the Izzy moving up. And then uh, – I put on my Instagram, question and answer. So Danny has a whole list of questions that we'll be able to answer. But first, I want to get on to uh, our big discussion on that. Is he moving up on weight? What's the timestamp? That's been about seven minutes for all you people complaining on YouTube that we banter about nothing. Just go directly <laughs> to like seven minutes. <laughs> so don't cry over sp- and I'm not Absolutely. doing fiver is what you got in seven minutes. Leave me alone. So yeah, what do you think? Is he moving up? So let's first talk about my experience. Um, again, I'll, I'll recap it. When I got signed with Glory, uh, just before I got signed with Glory, I fought Medi Baghdad. Um, and it's the first time in my life I had to make 160 pounds. Worst experience of my life. I didn't even have my training partner or my coach. I had to cut all the weight by myself in a hotel room. It was terrible. Um, it was one of my worst weight cut experiences. So never again after that. Because I was trying to make 155. My goal was at this point, Glory didn't sign me. I was like, man, I got to go to Japan. I got to fight at 155, the K1 max. So I was killing myself to get down. So Glory signs me after Baghdad. 165 I make the weight it was good and then they kind of forced me into a decision for my next fight they said you go 155 or 170 so we made the decision that 170 was it and then uh, that's where Costa came in because a lot of times I think I would say my body frame wants to be bigger I'm a naturally bigger guy and to hold my body down that small was a big challenge yeah, and I mean, we look back, and, and you, you were a tick boy when you were uh, in, when you were younger. Yeah. You were a big tick boy. I still, there. I can put on some weight. I got those Italian up. genetics. Yeah. Come on, man. I, Is he, you know, but uh, and we fought your first, um, your first pro fight at one one fifty seven against uh, Max Chen, right? Uh, uh, no, yeah. was it one fifty seven or one sixty two? I think we met at like a little bit of a different. No, I think they wanted one fifty five, and we got the one fifty. Whatever. This point, you had to cut a lot, so and that was a really bad weight cut. I, and it's uh, we'll never wish that upon again. But I knew you had to fight at a bigger weight class. I mean, originally, we were looking at you in 170, 175, like even back in the day. If you couldn't get a contract, we were looking at guys like Joe Schilling, um, for yeah, you, the two. bigger guys, yeah. You know, we I wanted you a little bit bigger, I didn't want you to blow. You have a tendency to blow, um, without increasing your power, just the way you hold weight, yeah. Uh, so we had to do it the right way. So two ways. There's only two ways you can do it: training and diet. You could do it through steroids, but illegal, not healthy, not good for the kids. Um, so what we had to do is implement a bodybuilding block. And when I say bodybuilding block, I don't mean you know arm curls and, and uh, kickbacks that you know work in bodybuilding to get individual muscles built bigger. I mean a whole body, kind of a, a mostly compound movement. So the big lifts, you know, squats. Uh, bench, um, deadlifts, big movements that use compound, they use more than one body part. Those are the best mass builders. And, and you and kind of I, adjust the, the the volume, right? You're not going to have me at three reps if we're trying to put no, weight on it. That's what right? I'm saying. That, when you go lower reps, you're not going to get, you're not going to put enough emphasis on the muscle, enough breakdown on the muscle so it builds down bigger. So we had to increase the volume from where before we would go more of a five, three, one approach. So five reps, three reps, one rep. Yeah. Um, Which is we, more strength based, right? Yeah. We move eight to 10 um, and, and increasing the weight and decreasing the weight as necessary as a percentage of your one rep max. I mean, I would get sometimes your 60% of your one rep max for 10 reps and you would grind it out. Yeah. We, the slap outs at the end of the reps slap after down. of our sets, we call them the slap outs where we so just put the volume. You want to get the blood in the muscle. You want to break yeah. down the muscle. At the same time, we needed the right nutrition to yeah. build, to actually doing the repair so we up the calories big time yeah especially the protein you got me yeah like up it you had me eating a full chicken a day at least just go get the go get the chicken just up really up rotisserie chicken fats uh keep an eye on your weight if you were gaining too much then we knew it'd be mostly fat uh i wasn't good with the calipers so i couldn't really so i just kind of like had to look and see what this weight on the scale was moving 
Um, but also I wanted to see an increase as your weight increased. I needed to see an increase in your strength and your power, because if I wasn't seeing an increase in your strength as we were gaining weight, then what the hell's the point? I might as well have you fight a lighter weight faster at the same strength. So right? let's bring down the timeline though, of how I had, because I think that's an important factor. I believe I fought Derechi in April and I want to say my Ambank fight was June. Yeah. So maybe three so months. Is, your body was primed to grow. Okay. Yeah. You were in a growth because you had deprived your body going into that. So it was kind of super compensated. I've been depriving my body for years at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we were, so we were super compensating. And I mean, let's be realistic. You, it's genetics. So I couldn't do the same on you as I can on a lot of people. You, you have a tendency to be able to put on that muscle lift on the right way. So we, we got really lucky. And I think you, if you want, and going back to Izzy, if you want to fight at a big, at a higher weight, you have to make sure that you're actually getting stronger if you're doing that. Otherwise, you might as well just fight at your same weight that you're comfortable in. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Because you're just going to get slower if you're getting bigger. Uh, so if you're moving there. Let me play devil's advocate at this point, though. Yeah. People are going to say with strength work, with the increase in size, with the hypertrophy training, it's going to slow you down. And with only three months, how can you build hypertrophy and power at the same time? That's where we go into block training. So, but remember, a, three months, right? So we maybe a what a, a month a of those three of hypertrophy. Yeah. So that's a block. So you got. So what you're doing is you're just changing it around. So I always work everything in in a training block. I don't believe in working just hypertrophy block, just speed, just power. Because what happens is if you're working one thing and neglecting the others, then you have to rebuild them at the end. No, no, no. You emphasize one more than the other in a training block. So for instance, going into a fight, I'll emphasize power and speed. Uh, more than hypertrophy but yep. if we're moving hypertrophy i'll put that as the main emphasis in your block but i'm still start doing speed programming i'm still doing power not speed uh, explosiveness uh power um and and we're still putting that in there so that stays that's maintenance but it will actually still gain through a hypertrophy yeah. program if you look at if you look at you know as you get stronger or as you get bigger and as you're moving more weight for 10 reps you're still going to get stronger you're still going to get Big more time. power yeah right? But then you put in that uh, power and speed and uh, explosiveness, you're still going to keep that going. You just emphasize one more than the other so you don't lose that other aspect of your training. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point of conjugate training, right? I, I mean, it's not something I made up by myself, obviously. It's something, you know, I took a lot from West Side Training, Louis Simmons, who got it from the Russians um, back in the days from the Russian text. Uh, that's more of a powerlifting. I adapted it over to MMA and I adapted it to stuff that works for your body and uh, the guys I train. Again, it's not the only way to do it. If someone out there, someone out there is going to say, ah, nah, you know, I got to do this way works. This way works. Great. Do that. Fuck. This, is, this is just what works for me and uh, my guys. And, you know, seem to seem to go. So go nuts. Do whatever you want. I always change my methods every day. If I were to train you now, Joe, I would train differently than I did then. Sure. Um, I don't know how we would have to sit down and work the program, but I'm always learning, always evolving. I'm not stuck in one method. I mean, and you look at how we train from the beginning to how we train to at the end completely different you have to always be evolving always be studying take the do the bruce lee style and take the best from each discipline and what the best that other people are doing and put it into your own kind of program these people who are stuck in their own ways and never evolving and thinking they're right with their dogmatic approach it's just what kills the industry mm -hmm. and it keeps it holding back i don't care to argue on twitter about some guy or or, or you know some strength coach out there who's putting their people on something is like, this is the only way to do it. I'm like, yeah, that's working for you guys. Congrats. Maybe I'll take something off you guys, but it doesn't make my way wrong. It doesn't make your way wrong. There's no wrong or right. This isn't an exact science. It's an art and science. Do what works. Stop bitching other people that their stuff doesn't work. Stop sitting on the damn internet and saying, oh, you know, this study didn't do this from some person who's never trained anybody in their life. Go out there, get it done, train, let the results speak for themselves and add something to the community instead of being a little, you know what, and, and, and you know, uh, oh, I went off on a ranch. Oh, yeah. You think? I was just waiting for you to finish. I was like, all right, man, do you, do you want me to go home and come back in 15, 20 minutes? I'll grab a coffee or something. Jeez, man. Can't wait to read the comments on this one. All right. No, but honestly, you did. Uh, I really liked what you said before you got into this strength coach ranch of other people saying that all baloney stuff. But I actually really liked what you said because I think what you have to understand is that you have to 
kind of play with the different blocks. Like just because you're in a hypertrophy block, I'm pretty sure you can still maybe warm up with some explosive movements. Maybe at the end, you can add a little bit more of the power training. So I think you could kind of cross over the blocks a little bit, especially if you only have three months to put on size and power. I mean, they go hand in hand. They work together, right? It's just like energy systems. Like even though you're an anaerobic athlete, you still have to develop your aerobic system a little bit, right? To balance everything out. And it helps with recovery too. The better aerobic system you have, the better it helps with time, recovery. Right? And it'll, it'll help you recover from the lactic acid a little bit faster and the byproducts. So, I mean, you have to have more of a balanced approach. So, I mean, at a time like that, I mean, I mean, it's okay. I would think ideally, I'm, I'm sure you want to keep it into certain blocks if you have the time, but from listening to Adesanya now talking, his approach coming into this, I don't know if he's trying to play the, you know, um, I'm going to go in light. He's saying he's going to come in about a, a, a buck 95 in a, in a 205 fight. So right is that John a mistake Jones. or is it better now to say, hey, I'm not going to focus on getting all this weight. It might slow me down because Adesanya's game is all about distance control range. Whether he's five pounds lighter and heavier, I don't think a range fighter, that makes a difference. So if... Bohovic can close the distance, it'll be a problem. But Izzy can manage it, so I don't think that extra little bit of weight would really matter. I would personally would like a little bit of size myself, though. He might get away with it against him, Joe, because of his inferior skills. But can he get away with that against John Jones? Well, I mean, John Jones is now a heavyweight, man. The guy's massive. You yeah, know? But, uh, if, I, if that's uh, the fight they're going to talk about. But yeah, I just think that's that's where it becomes a problem. I still think in, in my mind that the only way Adesanya gets beaten is mostly if he needs another elite striker. I mean, I just think or a, a phenomenal Khabib style wrestler. But I mean, it, it's going to take someone that's spectacular on either sides of the spectrum. You can't just be in that middle range and expect to beat him. You got to be either the best of the best wrestler or the best of the best, you know, striker, which he's playing at that point of being the best of the best striker. So there's very, very few that I feel that could uh, outpoint him over there. Which is funny to me, because to me, he's an above average striker in glory, but he's not like the elite killer striker that he is in UFC. Yeah, I thought I still thought he did very good in uh, in kickboxing. I mean, 75 fights, only like three or four losses on his career. And I think that's what people forget. Like he's undefeated in, in MMA, but the, the amount of kickboxing fights you have, the experience and kickboxing isn't like this is what I try to tell a lot of people. Kickboxing necessarily is not the same as MMA. Like when you fight someone in MMA, you might fight someone with 10 fights. 15 fights like you know you look at all the records when the fights are on oh 10 and 2 14 and 1 you know 5 and 3 8 to 10 fights look at the guys I fought 95 wins 5 losses you know 75 wins for Adesanya 4 losses like you're talking about guys with 80 90, 100 fights before they're 30 years old. So, I mean, it's crazy. Look at Cedric Dumbe right now, you know, the, the welterweight champ of glory. He's got 80, 90 fights. His opponent, Myrtle Grunhart, 80, 90 fights. Like, it's a different experience, and that's the kind of realm that Adesanya grew up in. So I think the confidence that years of kickboxing is just going to be uh, quite quite a, a, a bit and a big experience for him. But big power, size, endurance is all that Bohovic has. I'll defer to you. You're the expert there. I'm not going to try and tell you you're wrong. <laughs> like, what am I going to say? All right. Uh, last point on is he moving uh, up in weight that you want to make? Because then uh, we're going to go into our question and oh, I answer. Think, I think he should. For his for his career, he should. And, I mean, let's be real. At that level, he should have a uh, a sports science team that he can pay out because he's making a lot of money. Um, that's going to give him the extra edge in nutrition, supplementation, and everything. Uh, so he can pay enough to get himself uh, up to that next level. And I think for his career, and I think with the way the UFC is now, you've got to be a multiple weight class champion um, to really make your you know crossover appeal and legend appeal. So I, I think he's got to do it. So I think it's good for him. And just get – he's got to get bigger. He's too skinny All right. for that weight. Any anyway. other rant to other strength coaches who talk bad about – their ways and your ways. You're good. You okay? I like how I like how this industry now. It used to be. See what? It used to be a very male-dominated industry, and I think that caused a lot of the problems. A lot of ego. A lot of male stuff. My way is the best. I think there's a lot of women getting into the industry, and I forgot this uh, bodybuilder who has a, um, a a female strength coach now, and he just won. Uh, it was wasn't. Uh, she won an award, or no? She's really she trains a lot of top-level bodybuilders, but I think it's. 
with more women coming in the industry, it actually makes people think because they're more receptive into, you know, sharing uh, ideas and not being so defensive. And it actually will improve the strength coach community because it's just, it used to be so damn toxic. I mean, a lot of the reason why I kind of stepped back a little bit, it's just like everybody's so yeah. damn toxic. But I think it's getting better anyways. Well, there's, uh, one, uh, there's one guy that I like to watch on YouTube. I don't know him if he knows uh, my channel or anything, but it's Phil DeRue. He works with a lot of uh, UFC guys. He puts content out like every other day, a lot of good stuff. I think you should check him out. I'd like to hear your opinion on him because he's uh, he works with Dustin Poirier. I think he's got Kelvin Gaslam now. So a lot of the big guys in the UFC, he seems to be one of the more popular names in it now. So yeah, I think I've actually sent a few of his videos, but yeah, check him out. He seems to be the YouTube guy that's specializing in uh, strength and conditioning and MMA. Phil, let's get on the show. Let's chat. That's it. Honestly, I would love to hear you guys talk. I would love to be maybe just like create a question and answer for you too. But yeah, check him out. Koss, I really, really like his stuff, man. Really like his stuff. So Danny, let's get into it, man. I, uh, question and answer and let's see what we got. Let's uh, see what kind of well, the questions the we got. The first one is pretty obvious and we're already on topic of it. Will Iz Izzy beat uh, Jan? Uh, will Izzy beat Jan Bohovic? I believe so. I think uh, Israel Adesanya's uh, ability to manage distance um, doesn't really matter if he's a middleweight or a light heavyweight. I think his range, his distance deception, his fainting will be able to keep Bohovic away. Um, and I think he'll get it done. Um, if I am Israel Adesanya uh, and I'm fighting a bigger guy, the keys and the strategy, which um, with Adesanya with a kickboxing focus, I think this will be the strategy. It's going to be a lot of movement, obviously managing distance, and I think it's going to be good kick timing. He's going to chop away at the calves, maybe body kicks, keep the stance switching, staying long, using his kicks. His kicks are his longest weapon. He wants to stay away from the power punches and that forward pressure. So feints, distance, deception, long range, keep chopping away at good kicks, and then eventually uh, the legs will start to hurt of Bohovic, and then he'll probably catch a shot or a nice counter shot finish. So I think Izzy gets it done uh, um, either decision, I'm leaning towards decision, but don't be surprised if uh, he can get it done around four. And someone brought up Jan's body kick. How will Izzy deal with Jan's body kick? Honestly, Jan's body kicks are very good. Like watching him on pad work, very stiff, good punches. Uh, his punch to left kicks are phenomenal. Like, um, is it as good as Adesanya? Different style. Adesanya is more hands down, elusive, fade. But Bohovic has that more of a, honestly, like a, a, a power style kickboxing. Like his combinations, he's going to go good punch, good power left kick. So I think his kickboxing is pretty sharp. So um, I think his left kicks could be a factor of just uh, whipping them. The problem is Adesanya comes from a kickboxing background where he's been kicked a million times before, you know. So uh, kicks don't phase him as much as other fighters would. But uh, I think Bohovic has to mix up his strikes. But the key for Jan is not necessarily the kicks, it's the ability to pressure against the ropes, uh, sorry, not against the ropes, against the cage, try to use his clinch, try to get Izzy against uh, the cage and grind him down if he can get the takedown. That's what he's got to do to try to wear him out in those grappling exchanges. Uh, someone else asked, who would be your top choice for a stand-up fight with a UFC guy? So I guess if you uh, had a stand-up fight. All right, Koss, you start with that. Stand-up fight. Yeah, I, that, that's an easy one. I've answered this a couple of times on the I don't know, man. Who do you got, Joe? My my answer is easy. Like out of with all due respect, it's Wonderboy Thompson. Oh, for you fighting? I think for you me just fighting. Want... No, it's for me, right? Is that the oh, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's for oh. me. Oh, buddy, easy. Go, go, go against anybody. Just make you know who else thought it was good, and I actually just before today I listened to a podcast. He wants to make a return. Uh, Dan Hardy. How would oh, how fun that that would wow. be? Uh, that would Wonder, kind of be an intriguing. I think Wonder Boy would be a can for you at this point, Joe. No, oh, come on, Costa. I want to say, I think he's past his peak. I think he's been he's figured still out. ranked four in the world. No one's, he's only been finished once. Come on, man. <laughs> Give the guy some credit. Am I, I going to win? Oh, yeah, obviously, our confidence, we're on the team. I'm just saying that obviously. For a <laughs> I just, that for a I just want to comment on that to see who listens to the whole thing. Yeah. No. Actually, I want, I want money for it. I want to see you come out against GSP. Like GSP. that's no, nah, it's, it's wrestling. That's not fun. We're talking about a strand up fight, man. You're no, talking about a guy who dominates in wrestling. I want to see you against Connor. I want to see money for you. Know what's fun? Yeah, Making that's fun. Money, money fight. 
the the guy the, the the build up to that that's fun people okay. want the build up all right that's a, that's fun yeah Okay. I like, I would like, obviously those ones, but I always would like to test myself against, uh, like a Diaz brother. Like, I just want to see if the swarming forward pressure fights, but if I had one, it, it makes sense that it would be wonder boy Thompson, but yes, the money fights would, I'd love Connor. It would be fun to well, Masvidal. It would be fun. Even That's Darren the- Till would be fun to talk. Like so many fun matchups, like, uh, especially between 185 and welterweight. Yeah, hell yes, but yeah, okay. that's that's my my answer. For the record, I think Wonder Boy is good. I was messing around, guys. No, a know. lot. <laughs> we know, we know. So uh, this is a two parter question. All right, two different people, but they kind of go hand in hand. So the first one is: Are you keen on trying MMA? So I guess a follow up question would be: Do you think you're going to fight again, or will you stick with coaching? What do you I'm want? Think- oh, okay. So I guess this is Costa's question and answer. All right, go. I like it. You can get to the second part because I'm not going to But the MMA, and here's the story I have. I just remember going back to the beginning uh, when we were, you know, just starting out. We were we the amateur. We knew you were going places. You had your, you know, you had six months of uh, JITS experience. You were killing it. Uh, Monkey, Nanku, and the guys are like, yeah, it's sick. You can do it. You know, athletes and athlete type of thing. And you have the strength for JITS. And I'm like, Joe. We got to do MMA, man. We got to do MMA. You're like, I love kickboxing. bro. I'm like, do you understand the possibility? GSP was just starting. I go, you could be the next, you could transcend the sport. You could be like the Tiger Woods type who, you know, the Hulk Hogan type who, you know, becomes bigger than the support sport. Eventually like GSP type type, right? I go, you, you know, you got the looks, the charisma, you got the skills to do it. MMA, there's, I'm like, there's no money in kickboxing, bro. You're like, no, man, I love it. I'm a kickboxer. I'm like, you're like, I could do it in kickboxing. I'm like, fine. So you went to kickboxing. You obviously won the championship. But to this day, you would have dominated weight classes. We could have been chilling in Miami in mansions, you know. <laughs> yeah. It would have been great. But yeah. that's my story. Now you may continue. That's your story. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. But, uh, yeah, my – my um, what I want to do MMA? Abso- absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, if they're um, – Okay, let's go to the second part, then I'll go back to the first one. To me, honestly, at this point of my life, I train like a world title every day. It, whether there is a world title or not, I still train every day in my life since my world title like I'm continuing to fight. I train hard every single day, every single day. If anything, I train more now because when I was competing, I was still a full-time high school teacher, so I was only able to train once a day. Now I'm able to, as I'm coaching with my gym and running it, being full-time, I'm now training twice a day. I'm in better shape. My fight IQ is now through the roof through four years of studying and coaching, and my IQ is I fights, and my mind is on fire right now. I feel uh, the most knowledgeable I ever have, I can fight full southpaw now. I can fight orthodox. I can straight box. Everything that I wanted to improve when I didn't have time in my career, I improved in the last four years. So I put myself as a, a lot higher and a better athlete than I was before. The only thing that's different now is I would need to really hard train the anaerobic system. I need to spend two months on making sure I can do three five-minute rounds at the highest pace. So I'd have to change my training around because right now I'm doing a little bit more aesthetic looking, a little bit more bodybuilding mix. I want to look good. So if I added a little bit more anaerobic stuff, it would help me into that position. But ultimately, it w- if, if I were to come back, it would have to be MMA, to be honest with you. Um, I like kickboxing. It would have to be um, in either sport, money has to really talk. If so, if there's any organization that wants to drop some big coin, I'm not about being a pawn in the game anymore just to do it. It has to make financial sense. So the big boys want to talk, you get the big boy out. So uh, let's see, let's let the, the money talk. Cool. All right. Um, and we're going to jump into another question that I'm seeing like a common question. It, it's, I mean, a lot of people are wording it differently, okay. right? But a lot of people just want to know what's your advice on dealing with the mental side of fighting. Uh, the mental side of fighting, that's obviously one of the most important parts of it. But uh, when it comes down to mental training, I think it's just uh, building a lot about confidence. I mean, it's uh, learning, training, putting the work in, putting the time, putting the effort and self-belief, I think that's uh, the most important. But no matter how good you are mentally, a lot of times that's the um, side that you really can't train. I mean, yes, you can see 
psychologists and to kind of help you through it. But some people are just naturally better than others at dealing with stress and the anxiety of fight day and the sleep before, the sleep after. So um, I think it's a very tough aspect. But if you come in prepared and you train hard and, and you kind of, you know, surround yourself with people in coaches and team that give you confidence, I think that's the most important thing. You need your boys around you all the time saying, man, you're amazing. You're going to be a champ. You, you need that environment to uh, to really do well. But ultimately, like I was one of those people personally where I could handle it. I had like I was an underdog in all of my fights. So I had to have that mental strength to be like, yeah, you know, Kareem Gaji's he's fighting his hundredth professional fight on my 11th, you know, like I'll beat him, you know, Holtzkin. All right, let's go. Let's bang out, you know. So I had that natural ability, but it came from training hard. It came from years of Taekwondo before and practice. So I just think surround yourself with right people and train as hard as you can. And then that will speak for itself. Cost, you got something on that? This is one you'd like. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I we might have talked on it before, but whatever. Uh, there's a difference in a great athlete, good athlete, and just regular people. And, and there's that switch. You know? And I think visualization is a big thing that trains your mind to have that switch. So, you know, you know, working with Joe and I've, you know, I've seen what uh, people like Bianca Andreescu won the U S open, you know, and, and champions like that. And a lot of the baseball players that we've trained that gone to the next level, right there, the difference with them is they visualize themselves at all times as, you know, winning, being the best. Yep. And it just becomes reality in their mind. And what happens is, a few, a couple of hours before the fight or before the match, there's a switch that turns on and they go into this different zone and it's really hard to describe unless you've seen it. And it's really an amazing thing. And I remember the first time I seen it with Joe was, um, you know, during his amateur fights, it was never really there. He was just going out there, dominate, whatever. I don't, but I saw it on his first pro fight against Max. We went yep, in there. I know exactly what you're and saying. He just zoned out and into, went into this place. And I was like, what the hell is going on right here? And I mean, I remember this one, this one random Guy coach coach. trying to he, give me yeah. advice on a jab me advice and joe's like it just saw him like, and i'm like telling the guy i'm like get out of here like and then but joe he it's like put it out of his head and it's just this crazy zone where his mind went blank and just everything goes and you see yeah. it change in his eyes and he goes into the ring he's not thinking he's reacting um and it's just that thing where you know when that on you're like oh he's not losing yeah. bianca had the same thing when i saw her go to the finals of the rogers cup she was sitting in there um, in the tunnel, went in that zone with her headphones on, and you could see that, you know, laughing Bianca, whatever, was gone. And it was just this person focused going out to, to, to face Serena Williams, the greatest of all time. And here's this kid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, that's the it's same insane. as Joe. And, she's, and, and, and you're like, oh, she's not losing. Uh, and, and so it's, it's this championship thing. You can't teach it. Yeah. It just happens, right? That's why there's only one champ out of millions yeah. of people. And it's really an amazing thing to see. And but if you're a regular person, it's it's to get Makes close sense. to that, level, that visualization, is that mental training, because mental training is everything. It, if you're, it, it dictates how you live your life. It dictates how you train. I get everything. negative thoughts, you know, but yep. I find that when I'm starting to think positive and train myself positive, my mind starts going in there. Your and cortisol it, levels are better. Life's better. Sleep's better. Yeah, it sounds diseases so cheap, are less. Yeah. yeah, it does. But law of attraction. I think when it bring it back to fighting, it's all about law of attraction. You have to stay positive as best as you can. There's there were Sundays where like I couldn't even get off the couch and I had to fight in two weeks, you know, and I was like, I am so sore. I'm in such a calorie deficit. I'm so stressed out. I got to work on Monday as a teacher all day and still perform. And I had to lie to myself being telling myself I felt great, even though it felt the lowest of the low. I had to lie myself self to feel great and I had to sit there every day and tell myself I'd be a champ you know my team told me I would be a champ so yeah surrounding yourself Danny any more yes uh, okay uh, let's do Paul, two more quick yeah. ones all right two quick ones uh, one more dealing with a lot of people want to know what you think about one FC and I guess the comparison with four ounce gloves and whether yeah. or not that trends I like that question court. I actually really like it because uh I'll be honest, when it comes to watching sports I love, uh, when it comes to striking, I would probably have to put, you know, MMA and kickboxing near the top, then Muay Thai, you know, because of the, I'm not an over fan of the, the rounds, the clinching, I'm, I'm a kickboxing fanatic. But with one, the Muay Thai in the, in the four ounce glove has been 
honestly one of my favorites to watch. Jonathan Haggerty, badass, Rod man. Tang. Rod Tang, Ooh, badass, Rod Tang you know? Logo. Like, watching these guys scrap in these four rounds gloves has been really something cool. So I, I really like 1FC. I really love the... The way that they do MMA, kickboxing, and Muay Thai, um, I think it's smart making the Muay Thai exciting with the, the three rounds and the small gloves. I think they made the right move, the right push. Um, those guys are banging out, and I'm excited. You know, look at the kickboxing. Last week, I saw Giorgio Petrosian fight David Kiria. Phenomenal, you know. You got Nikki Holtzkin fighting John Wayne Parr, which I don't really agree with the fight. I'll be honest with you. I think John Wayne Parr is too out of his, you know, he's too old now, just coming out of hip replacement. You're fighting a killer in Nikki. I mean, I don't agree with it. I think Nikki should be fighting higher level opponents still right now. But uh, yeah, I think it's great. I mean, Marat Gregorian's there now. Like they're they're doing some some good stuff there. So um, kudos to them. Yeah. I love One FC just because their CEO is uh, my boy. Victor. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but again, I'm a, I'm a glory for life kind of guy. So uh, yeah, I'm sport. I do like what they're doing. I think it just helps uh, the sport of kickboxing and that other people are putting on high level fights. So I really enjoy One, and uh, I will continue to watch and be a fan of their stuff. And uh, the last thing we're going to bring up is... That, uh, but, but about old fights. What about one want to pay out some big bucks? Right. Nikki, Nikki's fighting John Wayne yeah, Parr. If, they, like if they're talking about some big figure salaries, hey, let's why not? It's out there. There you go. Um, all right. So last one. Last final one is actually a DM that I know we talked about that you got about talking about your bag work series. Ah, I love okay, it. Yep. Your new bag work series and uh, how you're planning to uh, grow that. Yeah. So firstly, I would like to say to everybody, thank you guys for all supporting the, the YouTube channel and all the technical videos because um, honestly, I've been blown away by the support, the thank yous, the DMs uh, saying how much has improved your technique, your training, how it's helped you in fights and going in quarantine. You've watched all of the episodes, which is what I recommend. So those who have asked me, what could I do during quarantine training? Watch the technical series. Go back and rewatch them. That's the number one thing you can do because you're not only seeing me do it you're hearing my words and you're getting drilled so you're doing that visualized training that we've talked about being so important in this whole podcast so go back watch it practice it at home you don't need much space that's the beautiful thing about the channel so uh, but more projects are coming I've, I've been finding that the bag work series has been very popular and people have been commenting on how they follow it um because they have a bag at home and they don't know what to do. Costa, for example, just has a new bag set up. So what I decided to do, and um, I'm hoping with Danny here, um, so you know you're getting the video quality that we're looking for, it's uh, starting a monthly site. Um, it's gonna be a bag work dedicated site where starting April, I will have uh, weekly workouts, technical, um, if you want to work your technique, there's going to be discussion forum boards so like the Team Bazooka community can come together. I plan on doing question and answers there for the, the community who's supporting the uh, monthly subscription. Looking at hopefully a, a small price, maybe $9.99 a month, something like that, and just pumping out content so you can be that um, you know, you can get in shape, learn martial arts at your bag at home. Nothing beats that, right? And I really haven't seen anyone do it, and that's my passion. So uh, no better way to do it. So look out for April for the Bazooka Bag Work uh, monthly subscription. Cool. You're going to sign up, Cos? Absolutely, Joe. You better. I mean, you got that I bag at home, and uh, so you, you have no choice. So we'll, uh, I want to see a before and after of your technical training with me. All right, Costa's. Uh, Costa. <laughs> Costa, he, he's, he, Costa's just like, okay, he doesn't want to do it. So you usually you can't shut him up. And now all of a sudden, it's just dead silent when I asked him to send a video. It's like, room. All right. Because cool, I thought Eddie was like looking at me like where he was going to cut out or something. No, no like, cool, man. All right, Cost. Just I, as I, long I, as you I, enjoy the videos at home, maybe I'll give you a personal uh, lesson here. And I like to point out viewers, I do have uh, what is 15 years of uh, kickboxing yeah. experience. I know training. that's why I just I still hope you uh, to do it and be part oh, of the uh, forum. That's one of my main things. I'd love for you to come on and uh, people can maybe ask you questions on the forum as well. Maybe they have a strength question and there's a section on maybe strength and conditioning questions that you can kind of chime in for everyone. I think uh, the community and uh, the squad bazooka um part of the subscription will enjoy it so we'll add that feature as well i look forward to the money for that that's it there you go buddy you're getting you're getting you know this time on this amazing podcast you know what, what else do you want look at all this fantastic exposure 
And I gave you a nice backdrop today, even though you're not here. You're pretending you're in there with me in spirit. <laughs> yeah. Hey, can we point out that equipment is original Tempest Performance equipment? That is. Many champions and greats have trained yeah. on this gear. I you squatted in that for my world title. I pulled those. That's the same weight I pulled for my world championship. So uh, it's actually an important part of the gym. It's like a museum now. You come and take, a, take selfies. Take selfies. Yeah. Um, all right, Koss, um, hope you're actually, oh, before I go now, cause I'm going to jump on and do a call with Aaron Bronstetter. I was uh, making an analogy on our TSN MMA show and I was making an analogy about collectibles and Aaron Bronstetter called you out. You're saying that I'm out too much with you about your sports card collections. He asked me, are you kidding me? So he called you <laughs> out. So he called you out being that I'm listening too much to you and your, your sports card rants. Hey, it, it, I'm telling you, collectibles have blown up. Crypto collectible, NBA Top Shot. Anybody who's on that, it's a, like a it's a two hundred million dollar business right now. It's it's sports cards through the roof. It's a good you know it's fun. It gets people cash. You know like why why everybody loves it. Yeah, I've had since I've been tweeting about sports cards. I have more of the most random people. You would think it's like a certain demographic who collects sports cards, but I'm no. not ashamed of it anymore because the people who have been good. messaging asking me about their collections like CEOs, athletes. Ray Allen, and, uh, LeBron James, uh, Yanis, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce his last name, even though I'm Greek. They're, they buy, uh, collect their own cards. It's, it's crazy now, you know, yeah. just go with it. It's cool. I just think that in the past, like a lot of the older generation has that emotional connection to cards because that's what they did as kids. So now you have all this quarantine time at home and you're bored and you're deciding to look at cards. What? I'm into Why it. Why are they me down? The guy asked me about his collection. All right. Classic Anyways, Cost, good to talk to you. Uh, we'll keep in touch and smash that bag out for me after this podcast. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, brother.